Great, so a very warm welcome and we'll wait a couple of minutes um, for additional attendees and then we'll make a start uh, this afternoon. So I'm very pleased to welcome you. My name is Dr. John Reed, and I'll be leading the first part of today's uh, session and then I will be inviting um, questions from the audience throughout the session and I'm joined by a panel of uh, guest speakers um, who are going to respond to some of your questions. So do feel welcome to uh, put questions either using the Q&A or, or the chat function. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on both as we go um, as we go through today's session. So again, thank you, Will. Uh, there's encouragement there, again, to um, pop any questions you might have as we go through um, into the Q&A function or, or the chat function, whichever you'd prefer to use. So I'm really excited to welcome you here this afternoon. Um, the focus of today's session, I think, is particularly important given um, current sort of circumstances. I don't think it matters what sort of um, role you have in education. I think this is, I hope, um, relevant to your kind of professional experiences. So the title there is School Plus Compassion Equals Wellbeing. And just to give you a little bit of background about my own sort of um, interest in this area, the focus of my doctoral research was very much around uh, teachers' emotional work, support for their well-being, and the role of compassion. So I'm going to be uh, providing a kind of brief overview of um, some of my sort of doctoral research as we go through. Um, I'll be beginning with, you know, setting the scene, um, particularly around concerns about well-being in schools. You know, in addition to concerns about the well-being of children and young people, there are also concerns presently around the well-being of, of teachers and other professionals in school. And I think that's really kind of important to uh, recognise. In fact, uh, today, the Education Support Partnership are also offering uh, a webinar which is talking about the emotional dimensions of, of teachers' work. And, and that comes off the back of the publication of a recent report, came out yesterday, called Teaching a New Reality. So I'd encourage you to have a look at the Education Support Partnership website, you can download that report and it's kind of really insightful around some of the experiences that are having an impact on, on wellbeing in schools. I'm really interested in the role of compassion um, and particularly compassion focused ideas to support teachers. Uh, and at the end of the session, I'll be promoting the idea of compassion focused education, which is, is, is something that I arrived at at the end of my, my doctoral research. And I'll be encouraging you um, also, if you're interested in on our social media, uh, to join the Compassion Ed Revolution, which is something I've been uh, promoting over a number of, of years. So do, do feel welcome to add any, any comments you might have uh, throughout, the session, throughout today's session using that hashtag uh, Compassion Ed Revolution. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome our panel of guests, guests this afternoon. So we've got Laura Dennis, and at the moment we've got um, Patrick Alexander. So I'm just going to say a little bit about our, our speakers um, before we move in. So Laura is an experienced teacher and leader uh, working as an education outreach lead at the Mulberry Bush organisation which is a, a pr prodigious uh, residential therapeutic community school that is celebrating 75 years of its history presently. Um, she's also a senior associate member of APPCIOS. Um, Laura and her team focus on working with schools, other professionals and organisations to develop support for children and young people, and particularly those children with kind of more complex social, emotional, mental health and attachment needs. I know Laura's going to talk a bit about um, how we can support children with those particular needs and also how we need to really support the adults that work with those children as part of the Q&A. Laura is also currently developing uh, the capacity and strategy of her outreach team and her current focus is on the development of the newly created um, emotional and social curriculum and supporting um, schools and other settings across the UK through supervision, which again is something that I think is really important for for schools to think about uh, in terms of how we might support uh, the emotional work of our colleagues in schools. Um, she's co-leading on the Nurturing Schools project in Oxfordshire, working with school, four schools to develop their nurturing practices at whole school level. So a huge range of expertise and I'm very grateful, Laura, that you've been able to join us this afternoon. Thank you, 
Um, I'm also very pleased to welcome my colleague, Professor uh, Patrick, Alexand Patrick Alexander. Patrick is our, our resident anthropologist. Um, he's also the Director of Research and Consultancy at Oxford Brookes um, University. And Patrick, um, I hope, will be offering um, some considerations later on around the concept of intellectual well-being um, and its relevance uh, for authentic self-actualization, which I think, again, is really important around uh, teacher well-being of both teachers and students. So a very warm welcome to our panel uh, this afternoon. So I'm gonna now uh, proceed with um, thinking about the aims of today's session, and that's really about how we can work together uh, to create compassionate school communities. So that's the kind of aim of today's session. Um, and I think that's really important given the kind of current concerns presently, particularly around mental health, children and teachers and a lack of kind of recognition uh, within the policy context. Um, before we start thinking about compassion, I would like you just to pause for a minute and think about a time when you actually showed compassion to somebody. And I don't know who that somebody might be, but I'd like you to think about where you were, why did you feel the need to show compassion, how did you show compassion, and how did that experience make the other feel? So just a few moments to reflect on on those questions before we proceed. Okay, so as we move through the session, there will be some questions for you to pause and kind of reflect on really. Um, and I think that's particularly important given Professor Barry Carpenter's concerns, and these were six years ago. He was suggesting that what we see in this new generation of children, particularly those with complex learning needs, is vulnerability, um, particularly in emotional development. And his suggestion at the time was that vulnerable learners are fragile, and it's our quest as educators, or should be, um, to think really carefully about how we can support our children to become emotionally strong. And I think compassion might give us a way of thinking about um, the kind of social emotional development needs of our children and young people. You know, of course, we've had a uh, very difficult global context recently. Um, and Barry was talking about these sort of concerns pre-pandemic, but over the last couple of years, the NHS um, digital a longitudinal study have kind of recognised an increase in uh, the number of children experiencing needs around their mental health. In older adolescents, that's now increased to one in four, so a quarter of our young people experiencing um, needs around their emotional well-being, and one in six for, for kind of younger children um, as well. So, you know, wherever we're working in education, we're guaranteed to be working with actually quite a significant minority of children that might experience um, concerns about their sort of emotional well-being. The other thing to really think about is when we've experienced compassion from others. So again, a moment to reflect, where were you? Who showed compassion to you? How did they show that compassion? And how did you feel? And again, thinking particularly about the experience of compassion from others, that I think is such an important aspect of our professional experiences, um, particularly given Professor Catherine Weir's suggestion that well-being in school begins with the staff. We are the front line of this work, and it's hard for us to be genuinely motivated to promote emotional and social well-being in others if we feel uncared for and burnt out ourselves. And, you know, concerning the, the Education Support Partnership um, publication, again, released yesterday, Teaching a New Reality, highlights um, the significance, really, of emotional distress uh, amongst our sort of professional, um, you know, colleagues in whatever role they're working in. Um, and education can be quite a distressing experience, actually. This is a kind of scale of distress. And I suppose before I began presenting today, 
I was probably around that 30, mild anxiety, um, a little bit nervous. And, uh, but actually, you know, I'm hoping it hasn't interfered with any, any functioning uh, presently. But we do recognize that many of our children actually arrive in school with much higher levels of um, anxiety, maybe up at 60, moderate to strong anxiety. Um, some children actually quite distressed around their, their kind of experiences around education. This week, of course, is, is SATS week. And depending on how schools kind of explore those experiences with children, you might be finding in your schools, again, quite high levels of anxiety, not only uh, in the children you're working with, but perhaps with your colleagues and perhaps with parents and carers and so on. Um, so, you know, actually what we've got to be thinking about is how we can minimise, um, prevent or alleviate some of those experiences of distress. And I think compassion might offer us a way to, to do that. When we think about our current education system, uh, it's very much sort of, you know, focused around these four areas, I think, competition, comparison, uh, compliance and control. And I think we should be moving more towards an education system uh, which is more compassion focused, which exhibits more care, encourages more uh, connection and facilitates more collaboration. So I think, you know, we're moving or hopefully moving away from um, some of these experiences that might create distress into these kind of different experiences. As I suggested previously, my doctoral research was very much around the emotional work of teachers and teaching is a relational activity. Um, it involves lots of different emotional experiences with a range of different kind of people, as I say, children, our colleagues, parents and carers and so on. And during our work, we can experience a variety of kind of complex uh, emotions that can positively or negatively influence our, our well-being. And from the minute we wake up to the minute we leave and the minute we go to bed, probably, we're often kind of thinking about these complex emotional experiences and how we might navigate those in the social space of school. This emotional work is very different from our physical or intellectual work because it involves those emotional experiences and it involves us thinking about the emotional impact of our behaviour on others, but also thinking about how the behaviour of others impacts on, on those that we work with. So it's very much around kind of social interactions in particular social contexts. And we're required as teachers to regulate our emotions, feelings and behaviours constantly. Um, and you know that's to do with the environment we're working with. So often, in fact, this is what teachers do very, very well. They're exhibiting care and enthusiasm and sensitivity to ensure that others feel safe and are comfortable. But sometimes we have to hide or disguise our feelings, um, you know, such as fatigue and tiredness, anxiety, or maybe even uh, fear in some in some situations. So, you know, we're constantly regulating our emotions and we may not express our authentic uh, emotions and feelings. And I think that that that's what this emotional work is, is, is all about. So now I'm going to just very briefly give you um, some insight into the work that I was particularly interested in when I was developing my doctoral research, which is around the importance of compassion in education. So again, a minute to pause here. What words do you associate with uh, compassion? What words would you use uh, to describe compassion? So just again, a minute of, of reflection before we move forward. Okay, so from the perspective of uh, a sort of compassion focused therapeutic way of thinking about compassion, this is Professor Paul Gilbert. So over the last sort of 40, 45 years, Professor Gilbert has been developing this idea of uh, sort of compassion focused therapy. And, and for Professor Paul Gilbert, compassion is related to a sensitivity to suffering in ourself or others and a commitment to try and alleviate or prevent it. So there's a motivation um, associated with compassion. Here are some other definitions that also recognise that kind of motivation. Sorry, gone one, one too far there. But it's about sensitivity. It's about recognition of difficulty and distress in ourselves and others. And it's about doing something about it. So it's very much thinking about the well-being of ourselves and, and others. And it draws on a variety of different kind of um, Disciplines really very much interdisciplinary, evolutionary, developmental. Um, most religions have a focus on <clears throat> um, compassion as being very central, um, but this approach draws particularly around Buddhist psychology, 
and the notion of um, social psychology and, and neuroscience as well. <clears throat> so essentially is underpinned by a philosophy of, of compassionate humanism, which I think sometimes might be missing from our educational experiences. But essentially, it's a way of helping others to develop a, a motivation, a compassionate motivation for themselves and others, but also to be open to receiving compassion from others, to recognise when, when compassion is shown to us. So here are some books I'd recommend, uh, particularly from um, Professor Paul Gilbert, um, really giving an in-depth insight into the kind of ideas that underpin uh, the compassion focus work. Again, compassion is thought about, you know, compassion for ourselves, um, compassion for others and compassion from others. So this kind of flow of compassion is really important to recognize. And it's founded on principles of attachment theory. So actually, you know, increasing emotional safety, for example. It also recognizes the work of um, Stephen Porges, the sort of um, polyvagal theory. And that's the idea that throughout our development, we are, you know, evolved to uh, recognize both risk and safety and so the compassion uh, stuff works around a recognition of you know these experiences of risk and safety initially you know infants are dependent on those around them to create those experiences of safety and as we develop we we sort of experience social connectedness and, and um, co-regulation with others and that that's kind of again really important to recognize so you might be familiar with polyvagal theory um, particularly around the notion that there are experiences, physiological experiences that can lead to anxiety and panic and so on. I mean, there are other ways that we can support individuals when they're experiencing those through social engagement, connection uh, and so on. So I think polyvagal theory is really kind of quite useful. Um, Professor Paul Gilbert developed this idea about an emotional regulation system called the affect regulation system. And, and he, called, you know, he recognizes these three kind of main uh, systems that manage our emotions. So there's drive, which is associated with achieving goals. It's associated with consuming and, and accomplishing tasks, a very positive motivation. Um, there's also a threat protection system, which is how we manage threats. It's an Eve Renucci, um perspective around <clears throat> seeking safety. And there's this sort of soothing system, which is much more related to relational experiences. When we stop, we slow down, we rest, we experience emotional safety and care and kindness. From a compassion focused perspective, it's recognized that actually, you know, experience in education and in broader society actually sort of trigger the, the sort of drive and threat based systems. Um, and that can lead to experience of kind of difficulty or distress. So if stress um, and distress is experienced, it's because often this sort of drive is, is you know, resource seeking and so on, get out of balance with this kind of experience of uh, contentment because it can, you know, can lead to experience of threat. And I think some of our children this week might be feeling those sort of anxiety because of this sort of drive to uh, achieve in, in school at this particular, a particular time. So you might have considered various kind of attributes that might be associated with um, compassion. And from a compassion focus perspective, they identify six particular um, attributes uh, that are listed here. So care, sensitivity, sympathy, tolerating distress, empathy, and, and non-judgment. And those are important because they can help alleviate some of those experiences um, because it's about care for self and others. It's about recognizing distress and doing something about it. It's being sympathetic, being emotionally moved by the feelings of others. For adults working with children that exhibit, you know, high levels of emotional need, it's actually being able to tolerate some of those difficult experiences, those high levels of emotion that some children uh, might experience on a daily basis. And actually empathizing, you know, really trying to understand that what those feelings and behaviors are all about in a kind of non-judgmental way. So not criticizing or rejecting those feelings, but actually recognizing, you know, <clears throat> and sort of appreciating uh, those feelings. So my research looked at how teachers experience compassion in their school settings, um, compassion from and for others. Um, and for Phoenix, it wasn't about this. So it was more than cupcakes in pigeonholes. I think that's a lovely gesture, but actually uh, it's more about a sort of culture and ethos of, of, of you know, um, well-being. Um, so there were informal and non-structured approaches in these schools that supported work 
um, well-being. That was about relational experiences with colleagues. It was about openness. It was about authenticity. It was about being emotionally present for our colleagues and all that kind of thing. But also formal and structured opportunities. And, and I'm hoping Laura might talk a little bit more about reflective spaces and, and supervision later. But some schools have these kind of very structured uh, opportunities to talk about the emotional aspects of the work that can really help um, teachers to explore their emotional experiences together you know actually and that, that's really important to sort of coming to you know a shared understanding of where these feelings and experiences might be coming from so my research revealed that teachers needed the space and the time to be able to talk about the emotional experiences uh, that they they were going through on a, on a daily basis because Actually, I found that the emotional work was much more pervasive and complex um, than is being recognised presently in, in research and in uh, the current policy context. You know, teachers think about this emotional work often when they're not in school. So maybe before they get to school, maybe after school, at weekends, during holidays, and they need this space um, to be able to talk about this, this kind of work. So again, a moment to pause and reflect. Another really important aspect of this sort of compassion focus way of thinking is about self-compassion. So when did you, you know, experience compassion for yourself? Where were you? What did you do? And how did you feel? So a moment just to reflect on those questions. So just a moment to share, share a reflection. Before this session, I was feeling a little worried and a little anxious about the presentation. So I stood in the garden, I listened to the bird song and uh, I was able to fo focus my attention on a blackbird and the blackbird song just for those few minutes really helped me uh, to sort of physiologically, you know, rest uh, and relax a little bit before, before this particular presentation. So that was a moment of calm uh, before uh, I started this particular presentation. So there are a number of colleagues, both nationally and internationally, that are really interested in the role of um, compassion in, in, in education. So on my bottom left there is, is Dr. Mary Welford, and she was the first person I, I read about um, whose work has explored compassion-focused ideas in school. She has a number of open access publications and a number of books which I'll be recommending. Uh, Elaine Beaumont above her um, ha is actually um, a psychotherapist and trained psychotherapist and she's written another a couple of wonderful books that that might be recommended. Um, this is Marcela Matos in the middle here who's been doing some work around um, compassion in Portugal so I'll share some of the international work. Dr Chris Irons top right there um, I was lucky enough to met, meet at a conference he um, offers an introduction to compassion focused therapeutic ideas uh, and runs a really useful website with some useful um, kind of ways of thinking about compassion. Um, and at the bottom right there is Professor Frankie Maratos, um, who has developed a kind of, you know, initiatives around uh, compassion focused or compassion based initiatives in schools. And uh, it's really interesting to look at the evidence um, in terms of the positive impacts of whole school approaches that have compassion at the core of their work. So in 2015, Welford and Langmead undertook some research in a secondary school, and she continues to work with a number of schools, actually. Uh, this, this article was published um, by the British Psychological Society, but the findings were that this kind of way of thinking around the importance of compassion increased staff well-being. There was a reduction in staff absence due to sickness. Um, there was an increase in parental engagement because this became very much a whole school approach involving parents and carers. And a, and a decrease in low level disruptive behavior and exclusion, something else I'm particularly interested in. I'm actually um, presently campaigning um, around the aspiration to eliminate exclusions in our schools um, for, a, for a charity I work in. And this is really great for me to see that by focusing on compassion, we might be able to kind of, you know, have a positive impact on student engagement and behavior. This is one of the books I'd like to recommend by Elaine, Mo Be Elaine Beaumont and, and Mary Welford, The Kindness Workbook. It's just a wonderful book around compassionate, creative ways to, to think about your own well-being. I would consider using that for myself as an adult, but also there might be some interesting activities there to, to work with children as well. 
Frankie Mattos um, has a, a number of publications, again, by the psychologist, um, and her work, which is an open access publication, the references are at the end of this presentation, found that focus on compassion supported adults to cope with their students' behaviour, to actually take a step back and really reflect on, you know, at the reasons for the behaviour, what was the behaviour communicating? And I think that's really important as adults, you know, how we interpret children's behaviour influences our responses. Um, also thinking about the role of self-compassion in supporting the emotional demands of participants' professional roles. That was very much the focus of my doctoral research. Um, conflicts with colleagues, I'm sure we don't have conflicts with colleagues, um, but, you know, compassion was found in this particular study to help alleviate or prevent some of those uh, difficulties with um, colleagues potentially and also um, you know with some of the difficulties we might experience from disengaging from our professional roles sometimes we come home and we still think about the work that we've been involved in uh, during the day compassion focused ways can help us to disengage from our, our role this is more recent research here from uh, Matos in Portugal and her research found an increase in self-compassion um, an increase in compassion to others positive emotional uh, affect in, in terms of um, you know the way we think about our professional experiences reduction in anxiety depression and concerns about compassion and those teachers that scored higher in self-criticism which is also um, sadly you know a, an experience that many teachers have around their professional roles revealed in, improvements following their their participation in the program there's quite a wealth of evidence now uh, that recognises the impact of, of compassion on our professional roles and the impact on then the children that we work with. This is um, Dr Chris Irons here um, and again a wonderful book here, the Compassion Mind Workbook, really interesting um, activities there to support compassion for self and I really like this book around difficult emotions. A lot of the emotional work that you experience involves kind of quite difficult emotions that often uh, we don't have the space to talk about. So that's another um, book that I hope you might find uh, useful. Oh, now I put that in as a little reminder. That's me at a, a national conference uh, called Compassion in Schools. And there's Professor Paul Gilbert and the other um, speakers I've, I've, I've recommended today with, with Professor Catherine Weir there. But look out for their next annual conference. But it's a gathering really of, of people that are really interested in promoting uh, the importance of compassion in, in education. Um, the Compassion Mind Foundation is a really useful website and it's hosted by Professor Paul Gilbert and others, but lots of really useful there uh, resources there. And Balanced Minds also has a number of um, kind of practical um, introductions to why compassion might be, might, might be so important. So I'd really encourage you to have a look at those websites um, in your own time. So, I mean, I think the timing's gone pretty well there. I was aiming to provide a half an hour overview and by my clock, I've made that just 29 minutes. So I think I'm 14 seconds ahead of where I hoped I would be. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased now to welcome our, our, our guest speakers, again, Laura Dennis and Pat, uh, Professor Patrick Alexander. Just before we um, kind of move into our, our, our questions from the audience, which, which I hope they, you, know, you feel very welcome to share. Just wonder what your your immediate responses were to that that opening uh, presentation, Laura or Patrick. Which I go first? <laughs> yeah, for it. Um, so I suppose you know, as you were sort of sharing that, John, I think I was very much thinking about our own practice and what we do at the Marlbury Bush. Um, and again, referring back just to um, reflective spaces and supervisions that we provide for the staff. Um, so. At, the Marlborough Bush, which is a therapeutic community um, for children who have suffered significant early trauma. We offer reflective spaces and supervisions to all of the staff, whether you work as a teacher or um, one of the care staff in the care homes, you're an admin assistant, you're a cleaner, you're a cook, everyone gets reflective space and um, supervision, which just allows us to sort of really support people and support them to feel supported and process the work alongside these children in a safe capacity um like you mentioned so many of us in education and in other sectors when we're working with challenges and complexities with these um, children and young people we take them home and we don't always know how to process them safely and there's times when i think you know i've heard of cases where people have taken at home maybe discussed anonymously obviously um situations that are arising at work but then it's caused massive sort of family disputes um 
and because you know it's caused a bit of a friction between between partners and what have you or there's been people that haven't said anything at all and then they've just ended up being burnt out and unfortunately signed off of work so I think this you know compassion is so important and we've got to sort of hold it as a very high accord and like you said if the well-being of the staff isn't there then the well-being for the children isn't going to happen mm. I'm in my immediate response to to your your considerations there is that I've worked in a number of settings that support children with really complex social emotional mental health needs and some schools I think support this work really well they recognize it they acknowledge it it's part of the professional work to actually develop this kind of shared understanding about the impact of this kind of work and I've worked in other places where that has been neglected or ignored or not talked about and I think they're they're kind of very different ways of um, appreciating this aspect of the work so so in terms of what what colleagues could bring to these kind of reflective spaces what might what might colleagues share in these spaces um, so for some examples being if there'd been a particularly difficult incident or a difficult situation about a child or even just a feeling got to be an acknowledgement and quite often it's the unspoken word in a lot of schools that it's okay to have feelings about children um, yeah. quite often I think it's seen as unprofessional to voice your opinions about children and how you feel from working alongside them but it's very natural and normal for us to all have different feelings from working with different children. Mm. Um, so those experiences can be brought up in reflective spaces, but we also might explore sort of dynamics which are arising within the team. There's always going to be, I know we said, you know, you mentioned that actually, you know, hopefully there's not falling outs, but that there always is a falling out and there always is some friction or tension between staff members, especially when you're working in really difficult situations with complex cases. There's a lot of projection of emotion and feelings from the children we work with, which we can carry and absolutely do carry. Um, and so it's important that those spaces we are able to sort of explore that with one another. You know, oh, I made a comment the other day and I don't know if you took it in the right way is everything okay you know and just that's a safe space and and you know building those trusting teamwork relationships within the reflective spaces means that as an adult team we work better our well-being's in a better place and then we are in a better place to support the children so it mm. just feeds down the I mean, again, I think that that was a real sort of important finding for my research actually was that, you know, where teachers are given the opportunity to authentically voice their opinions in a compassionate space, which again, we think about those attributes there, non-judgmental, you know, sensitivity, empathy, you know, being able to tolerate quite difficult feelings at times um, in that sort of safe space is really important because otherwise, what we tend to do is take those difficult feelings away with us. And, and I think that's why I think that's why some I mean I've had it myself you know I've sort of continued to reflect on on really difficult experiences over a weekend for example and although I think that's an important aspect of our role um, I would have probably preferred the opportunity to have had the opportunity to talk about those experiences and, and try and you know draw on expertise of colleagues to help me kind of you know process and understand why I might have these feelings or, or how those feelings might impact on my work and, and so on so I think I, I really hope that there becomes a, an increased recognition at the level of government. I mean, we might have representation from DfE here today. I don't know. Uh, I don't know the professional backgrounds of our attendees today, but if you are here, DfE, if you acknowledge the emotional work, which I think you need to, you're gonna need to do something about it. And I think actually these kind of reflective spaces or maybe more formal supervision, um, you know, could, provide a space for teachers to to talk about this kind of stuff patrick can i invite you in here what what kind of things were you reflecting on around that initial opening presentation yeah thanks john I, you know it's, it's it's always so so thought provoking to to think about how compassion is framed in a way beyond what the the kind of everyday interpretation of it is i think you know people think about compassion and they think about um kindness they think about sort of you know acts of charity that kind of um, that kind of thing, which which is obviously part of what compassion is, but you know what you've presented here is so much more complex than that, and it involves um, hardship. You know, it involves uncomfortable moments. It involves, um, you know, to your point, Laura, kind of grown up, grown up conversa conversations where you have to kind of demonstrate a whole range of emotional competencies and be vulnerable, and mm -hmm. you know, do that work that then hopefully we can we can kind of model with the with the young people or the young adults that, that we work with. Um, 
so so that that to me is a really is a really kind of um an interesting provocation to say okay what what really is compassion um and what is it what um what is involved in in that kind of compassionate practice that isn't always easy that's not always an act of kindness i mean i think another really thing that that struck a uh, really interesting thing that struck me when you were talking was you know trying to respond to your prompts which I, which i'm sure uh, most people found quite hard um you know can you actually think of a of a moment that immediately springs to mind when you were compassionate or someone was compassionate to you or you're compassionate to yourself. And, and I was surprised to find the example of emails coming into my head, um, you know, a compassionate email or a compassionate email sent to someone else, um, which just struck me as a, a reminder that, you know, compassionate practice is everywhere. You know, we might be looking for the big gestures, but actually, um, you know, compassion is a, is a really boring everyday thing. Um, and, you know, sometimes, it, you know, struck me that you have to be, attentive to how compassion um, interacts with the architecture of our practice you know so so that makes me think about you know to what extent um, is email designed to allow me to be compassionate to somebody else to what extent is a meeting designed to allow for a compassionate conversation um, you know and, and you, you know your, your example is fantastic Laura of how that architecture can be shaped to build that in but I think unfortunately it's the, the exception not the rule. Um, and, it, and it raised some, some interesting thoughts around intellectual well-being, but I might save those for, for the time being and, um, and come back to them as we circle through the questions. But yeah, really, really thought-provoking thought stuff. I mean, on, 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 in a response to your reflection on compassion, I think that's really interesting because my research revealed that teachers are quite able to articulate how their colleagues' well-being might be looked after. So they can say, oh, well, you know, school does this for them and does this for them. They talk less about how their own well-being is supported by schools, but they talk even less about how they look after their own well-being. You know, and actually, um, my, re my research was really revealing around, I mean, sadly, how teachers don't spend enough time looking after their own well-being. Actually, who, you know, teachers were saying, well, actually, at the end of the day, I've got no energy. You know, actually, by the time I get home, I, I can barely make myself an evening meal and then I want to go to bed. You know, actually, the, the, these are really important um, concerns, actually, when we think about recruitment and retention in schools and, and we think about, you know, the sort of, you know, concerns about, about the well-being of teachers. I think, and I think, again, Laura's example might be an exception presently, but why is it that social workers have supervision? Why is it that psychologists have supervision? You know, why is it that therapists have supervision? It's because it's important. And actually, with the increase in, in the number of children exhibiting really quite complex you know, needs around their social and emotional um, experiences because of COVID, because of austerity, because of the digital space, whatever else, you know, I'm not suggesting that teachers need to be therapists, but I'm saying that teachers are in a position where they are supporting the emotional um, well-being of, of children I think they need more support actually um, because they are they are working in a very sort of you know empathetic sensitive and caring caring way with with our children and young people and uh, John do you mind if I just jump in quickly to, to ask a question to Laura about this because it struck me from what you were saying you know that sense of burnout I mean obviously we see it in the in the stats around teacher retention and recruitment and and everywhere else um, that you know well-being is, is a huge is a huge kind of you know sort of practical problem it's a huge economic problem in terms of how you know in terms of the profession um and it strikes me that part of that is about that that problem that you that you've articulated around productivity that you know teachers are, are expected to be so productive that there is just isn't the energy for for anything to do with self-care um but also that it's about speed it's about velocity of work that everything needs to be done tomorrow and uh, or today or yesterday um and uh, and you know one of the one of the kind of potential negatives of this whole AI explosion we've we've seen recently is that people think that the work is even easier to do, and they say, well, you've got these tools now, you need to actually be more productive, not less. And and I just wanted to to, to ask Laura, uh, you know, it strikes me that what you, the, the spaces you were describing seem to kind of counterbalance that that they slow things down. And they're not about um, productivity in the way that schools might normally think about productivity, but a different, different, and actually much more powerful kind of productive work. So yeah, I just wanted to ask if that if that resonates with 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 you with your practice that you were describing. Yeah, absolutely, because I think that is the work, and I think you know when I say you know reflective space is built into our working day. This isn't 
after school hours or anything this is built within our working day as as a supervision and quite often when I'm going into schools um, to deliver supervision and to offer supervision to the staff there they quite often say well I don't you know we just haven't got the time we haven't got the space you know we haven't got the capacity to offer this but what, what we're seeing is that that people are walking out of education because they are done they're finished there's no more compassion left in them mm. and and that's why you know I completely agree with John that you know I, I fight and talk to this you know until my heart's content to try and get this actually into policy because I think this this has got to be built in we've got to start looking after ourselves um so that we can be the best we can be because at the moment I really don't think that in education we can really say we're being the best we can be for the students and for ourselves um and so I think absolutely yes you know the pace of education whether it's you know young children young adults it's it's rapid it's ever-changing really really quickly but then there's also parts that have stayed still for a very very long time and actually we need a massive education reform this what we're doing now doesn't suit the cohort that we've got anymore and you know we should then be adapting and changing and things like that but we're not and so that's, you know, I, I think there's got to be change and change got to come um, for us to be more successful and for us to bring the next lot of children up in a successful way as well. So, yeah, I, you know, I completely agree that it, 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 yesterday something had to be done and it has to be done really instantly. But it's, it is sometimes just about coming down and actually sitting back to reflect and not just having that as your, your um, car journey home on your own. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I mean, just just to add a, a final thought there, you know, the, the fact that we most teachers, I think, will have come across reflective practice as part of an assessment regime, right, which, which is an, an interesting, you know, it, just interesting to think about how these terms get kind of, um, you know, they get overshadowed by the by the architecture of the practice. So even though it's called reflective practice, often it's about getting from A to B via reflective practice, as opposed to what you're describing, which is making the reflection it's you know a focus in its own right yeah absolutely and, and even the word supervision many many people don't understand what supervision is I mean I remember when I was first introduced to supervision I thought I'd done something wrong you know do I now need to be supervised doing my job because I've done something wrong and it's quite the opposite you know it's again that very safe space to explore and think about the impact of the work and that's and that's not just working with complicated. That's not just working with complicated cases and children. That's working with everyone. Mm -hmm. You are going to feel something from every single job you do. It doesn't matter where you work, what sector you work, and you're always going to have some feeling, and it's always going to have some impact on you. So where do you take that? And that's that's where supervision comes in. And I think you know, from my my experience of supervision, you know, what's useful is that these are non agendered spaces. You know, they're not they're, they're, there is no kind of agenda to the regular <clears throat> opportunities to come together. You can bring, you know, an issue that may have happened in the morning. It might have happened a week ago, but it's still this sort of regular safe space, which is an hour. Is that right, Laura? In your yeah, experience? usually an hour, but <laughs> sometimes they might go over if we try and keep time um, and they're protected. I think that's the other thing that it's a protected space. So if someone else suddenly says, oh, I need to have a meeting with you, I'm sorry, but I've got supervision, so it's going to have to fit around that. You know, it's hmm. and it's the same for reflective spaces. It, it's it's formalized. You know, you don't you don't step into that actual room space when someone is having that supervision or that reflective space. Yeah. Yeah. Again, and they're, they're kind of, you know, they're very contained in the sense that actually what's talked about within those spaces probably stays within those spaces. You know, actually, it's a space to really feel authentic and really feel honest. And that's why I think they have to be kind of um, supported in a very compassionate and sensitive way, because, I mean, Patrick, you recognise that actually sharing some of these difficult feelings increases vulnerability actually but that's important to I think exhibit that vulnerability and and to recognize that actually we're all the same in that sense we have these feelings we have these experiences and those spaces can you know can can offer something really useful around understanding the work which I think is is really important so again I'm keeping an eye on our our, our um, attendee chat and Q&A we did have a few um questions uh sent in before uh, the session I'll, I'll start moving through those now if, we, if we're happy to, to to consider these so I mean very interestingly given what's happening this week nationally in terms of our schools but our first question um, that we, we'd like to think about is how can our education system evolve into one where children are recognized as individuals rather than judged on results 
<laughs> That's a big one. Who'd like to take who'd like to take the lead on that for on that first question? I'm happy to jump in on that one. I mean, actually, I would I would maybe sort of gently disagree with that as a as a as a route to take. Um, I mean, I absolutely agree that we should you know we need to think very very carefully about um, what uh, knowledge production looks like in education these days. And and you know so often there are two major sort of misunderstandings when it comes to to, to discussions around education. I think the first one is that people mis mis mistake schooling for education. And, and you know, clearly we can make a distinction between the institution of schooling and what happens there and the experience of education, which is all of our lives. And then I think there is a, there's often a misunderstanding between knowledge and knowledge production and the fact that we can all be knowledgeable, but knowledge production happens in exams. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the production of very certain types of knowledge that then get to become representations of who we are. And of course, that's where the kind of the, you know the, the the implications for well-being come in. So for, for that question, I absolutely agree that we need to be very careful about thinking differently about um, how how we interpret what knowledge looks like. And of course, the new the, the kind of the revolution that we've seen in in AI in the last few months could be a really positive challenge for that. Um, in the same way that calculators were for maths mm -hmm. a few mm -hmm. decades ago, and you know um, I think maths teachers who were against calculators back in those days would have said. You know, you need to learn to, to do mathematics in this way because it's not like you're ever going to have, you know, a calculator in your pocket every day. <laughs> yeah. But lo and behold, um, so so you know, so so I think that there's a there is a big challenge there to say, well, um, knowledge production is changing very very quickly, and I think that the forms of assessment that we're using now will seem extremely anachronistic very very soon, and I'm sure the big exam houses are already working to figure out. How they might do that differently. So, mm -hmm. so absolutely, I think you know we will, we will, we need to, and we will see a shift away from thinking about ass assessing learning in the way that we currently are, which is you know, to, for all intents and purposes, a hundred years out of date mm -hmm. in, in my in my estimation. So, the, the next question is about individuals, and I actually think that that maybe is um, it, it could, could be challenged in so much as um, you know what we've seen in terms of youth. Uh, activism in, in the last, um, you know, sort of half decade hasn't been about individuals at all. It's been about collectives, you know, it's been about collaborative action. It's been about young people seeing, seeing themselves and seeing their futures, not about a single trajectory through the life course, not about individual gains, not even about individual well-being, but about a, a real sort of existential awareness of, of the collective and yeah. saying, you know, unless all of us together do something different, then you know we're not going to have a conversation to have in in a few generations' time, and so that that I think is another interesting way to think about changing the record. If we move away from individual assessments, if we move away from um, an understanding of schooling as something that happens to individual people, um, if we move away from parents being worried about only their children, I was talking to some teachers the other day and I asked them the question: When was the last time someone came into a parents' evening and said, "How is my my son's class doing?" And that question doesn't doesn't really get asked um, because, you know, understandably, that's not how our education system is is organized at the moment. But I think a shift towards a sense of of collective, um, you know, of collective moving forward, not progress, but moving forward together. Um, I may have just uh, coined someone else's political phrase um, uh, is I think it is a, is a really kind of profound shift in how we think about education. Yeah. Yeah. And again, would have such a positive impact on. The educational experiences not only the children and young people but but the school community you know i think that that again is sort of part of the focus of today is to think about how as a community we think more about you know this sort of way of interacting more compassionately with with with, with each other and uh, and facilitate feelings of, of you know emotional safety and all that kind of stuff yeah so i think that that's uh that's a really uh you know important response there thinking about how you know current contemporary concerns might actually positively influence uh the educational experiences of our children and, and young people i mean the next question patrick i think it's very much you know related to your academic interests you know about you know uh, futures and this question asks what's the best way to support students who see no future and don't have any goals I mean that's quite a big that's quite a powerful it's a big question isn't it yeah that, I mean that's that's a huge question and and um I but, but I think it's yeah it's there is no there is no more important question than that right to sort of say okay so what is happening for those young people 
that they don't see any future the, and they don't they don't have any goals. I mean, I think a, a recent um, you know historical example of that would be the umbrella movement in Hong Kong, where you know traditionally you had um, a, a, you know a sort of uh, to put it crudely a sort of a, you know a culture of deference to. Um, to, to your elders, what people might call a gerontocracy, right? This idea that you should respect your elders, and that you know the, the process of the process of, of kind of transitioning through the life course is about you know going to university, getting a job, um, you know, following a pattern. And in their resistance, um, and this is about you know Hong Kong's uh, sort of political change in the last few years, um, those young people were saying, well, "We have no future, so why wouldn't we fight in the present?" And for older generations, that was a really, really difficult concept to try and consider because they would say, well, what do you mean you don't have a future? You know, you need to plan for your pension, get a mortgage, all of these things. But of course, if you're a young person living in the present and you see a completely moribund political system or you see an existential crisis in terms of climate change, then I think it's absolutely justified to, to think that you have no future. Mm -hmm. And I think you, we might even complicate it one level further by saying, um, the version of the future that is often sold in schools is actually from the past, mm. right? So the idea of the future that we often see in schools is that if you work really hard at school and you pass your exams and you get to go to university, you get to go to a job, you'll make some money, um, you'll, you'll, you'll have a comfortable life, you'll, you know, and then we go through all the other things that people expect in the life course. Um, but of course, that isn't the reality that most young people experience. You know, everybody who is who is a young person today in school has grown up in the era of the financial crisis, of um, of the pandemic, of post truth, of populism, um, of the Ukraine uh, conflict. Uh, you know, they, 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 the the cornerstone of their experience of life is uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So I think it's absolutely understandable that somebody would think I have no future if the future I'm being presented with is one that is you know from the 1950s yeah. so that so but the, but there is a positive outcome of that of that discussion i think which is to say if not that future then what future mm. and and the, there is a really exciting prospect there i think in saying you know the future is not just one thing it's not just a shadow that is there waiting to kind of um you know to to kind of eclipse the present um you know the future is there to be made and it's there to be made in in the present mm -hmm. and so i think different kinds of future thinking can actually be be really exciting. So I think when it comes to practically, what do you say to a kid who says, I've got no future? Well, you say, well, what future do you want? And, yeah. and, and how do we make it happen? Mm. So it's that kind of, um, you know, to an extent, it comes back to that idea of, of intellectual well-being, the idea that, you know, it's all well and good to think about what you think is an ethical way to be. It's a whole different thing to act yeah. in an ethical way. And in, in making that leap from what you think is good to actually acting it out is future making right there. Mm. And again, uh, our audience must check out your work around, you know, future aspirations and so on, because I think that they're really important projects for, you know, to involve young people in the opportunity to talk about what they you know what they hope and aspire to in the future and, and as you say make moves towards those those kind of future aspirations which are really really i think is is very important uh laura if i could come to you next it is, is a question that says um i would love to hear uh, your thoughts or guidance on using our knowledge to implement this approach wider for other colleagues or, or whole school organizations so I mean, I know you're very interested in the sort of whole school organizational approach. What, what kind of advice would you give our attendee in, in, in that response to that question? Are we talking specifically about compassion, would you say? I think potentially around maybe the emotional aspects of the work, maybe around mm. supporting staff well-being. I think yeah. the, title of the presentation was school plus compassion equals well-being, but yeah. it's about this sort of colleague or whole school approach, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, you know, it's about building that into the culture and basically creating culture carriers who are going to carry that and I think quite often in schools that's very much fed from the top down so you've got to have your leadership team fully in that sort of understand having that understanding of what compassion is and what that looks like um I think the cupcake quote that you had up is you know that's that's an interesting one because compassion looks very different for everyone um and I think actually sometimes having those honest and open conversations of what is it that you need? What do you need? What does compassion look like for you? It means something different to everyone. But, you know, not necessarily thinking about the physicalities of 
having cakes in the staff room or things like that it's it's thinking about okay so when are we going to do those informal check-ins or oh I noticed someone was a bit upset yesterday let me go and check in with them today or drop them a text in the evening just to checking in um because those are the things that are actually really going to matter and make the difference and I think you know looking again at, at your your whole school policy so thinking about your relational you know have you got a behavior policy have you got a relational policy what's your policies with parents thinking about that wider community as well and building compassion into those so that it becomes really that whole school sort of ethos and just the norm um which means that once it's sort of fed through the school it will then reach the children and the parents and the families which will have that wider impact mm. um i'm just thinking at the moment so we're currently you mentioned earlier i'm working on the nurture project which is um, with delivering training alongside nurture uk which specifically looks at the social and emotional well-being of children but also within the project we're looking very much at the adults and actually the impact of the training that we're delivering and what that has on the adults does it mean that they feel more upskilled and able to reflect and think about you know the difficulties and the complexities to the work um so I think it's very much about creating that compassionate culture, but also providing time and space to reflect and not rush and run through things. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, I think, you know, that's so powerful, isn't it? That actually there has to be that an established culture of recognising, you know, these sort of feelings that teachers might have and doing something about it. You know, and I think um, I think if, if you if you're working in an organization where you're not encouraged to talk about feelings, and I have been in, in examples where, you know, schools aren't interested in the emotional aspect of the work, actually you're here to teach, you know, sort of get on with it or leave kind of thing. Um, that's when they don't retain teachers. They don't retain good teachers because good teachers care, you know, and I think good teachers think a lot about uh, the children. You know, they think about children's past experiences. They think about what's happening with the children currently. They often think about children's future experiences as well. And I think all that kind of stuff, um, you know, you need that space. But as you say, it, it takes, I think, leadership. And I, and I think it's that sort of whole school culture. You use the phrase culture keepers, and I really like that that phrase. I know that's a particular sort of Mulby Bush um, uh, phrase who who have very good retention rates for, for, for staff that work there because there's this kind of ethos and culture of, of a shared understanding which is created over time, I think, isn't it, actually? And, and that, that's the concern about, um, you know, the sort of the quick turnaround for some teachers in schools that actually we need to really strengthen the culture and, and, and community in our in our in our in our schools yeah Patrick you're, you're you're nodding along there would you like to add something there at all about the sort of cultural aspect maybe yeah well, it just struck me when you were talking Laura that there's that feeling uh, that there's that tension I guess between um you know when this is doing when this is done well and it when it really works and then, um, you know, when when sort of lip service is, service is paid to it and it actually makes the problem worse, I mean, you know, back to your quote, John, um, and, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of people have seen that kind of performance of affect, maybe especially from leadership, where there's a sense that you need to come into the room and show that you're compassionate, but the practice doesn't actually reflect anything, anything deeper. And so the, I, I think there is, there is something, um, you know, complicated there around how things like compassion or reflection can actually be kind of wielded against against people unfortunately mm. um and and actually kind of you know sort of re you know recreate the problems that they were looking to solve in the first place so so yeah i'm i'm, I'm really interested in that you know that what you were describing about how it, how it works authentically how you actually get people to uh, maybe back to that point about the you know the, the relationship between ethical thinking and ethical action how you get people to really seriously think about what they want to do and then see them actually acting on the on those you know on those on those points of principle so which i'm sure is a, is a hard you know that's a that's that's a challenge and i think you know there's an element as well of, of leaders thinking about okay so what does what do i want my school to look like and because you know quite a lot of the conversations around compassion and well-being often always comes around teach workload so what can they do to support their teachers to have a better well-being? Is it that they're going to have, I don't know, a no marking policy? Is it that they're going to say you're going to have two PPA sessions a week? I mean, that would be luxury and a lot of teachers would jump at that. But it's those things as well, thinking about how can we lighten that load? And then actually in the classroom and for the people that we're working with, 
what does that look like? Are we purely going to focus on all the academics or actually are we trying to create these sort of well-rounded human beings who are able to develop their resilience and their own compassion? But that's got to be almost taught and modelled to them. You know, it's got to be quite explicit to the children for us to, you know, to show that and, and they learn from the role modelling. So we've got to embed it into our adult group for it then to be role modelled through the children. And, you know, thinking about the emotional and social you know aspects of the work you know specifically okay let's how are you feeling talking about emotions I know zones regulation is used in many schools now quite often in the primary schools but I know it's going in secondaries as well and and learning it with those emotions so and identifying them and just no, recognizing those with the children I think is so powerful mm. And actually, it's, so, it's, it's something that adults quite often can't do. You know, we might be really, really cross, but sitting and recognizing and thinking, what, well, what is it that I'm cross about, or why, why have I picked up, where have I picked up this feeling, and where, why is it come coming out? You know, I think that's something that's really important. Mm, no, I'd agree. I'd agree. Yeah, and uh, we've got a couple of comments from our audience as well. Um, I'm interested in the evidence on this as it's a long held belief of my school that a safe space is a productive space. That's, you know, I think again, it sort of summed up some of the thinking for today. Um, another comment here, as educators, compassion is cr cr crucial in, in, in the school settings. And I would, I would completely uh, agree with that. So, um, I mean, I, I've, I've, you know, had some thoughts here about questions that we might consider. And I think actually we, we've really kind of thought through those questions by um, responding to our to our you know audience's questions again I'm uh, you know for those of you still in attendance I am still keeping an eye on the, on the chat and the, and the Q&A if you have any um, other questions you know as we begin to conclude uh, this afternoon's session if I may I'd just like to offer um, some thoughts in terms of a kind of uh, you know summary really in terms of um, you know perhaps you know wh where we've where we've come through uh, in in our thinking today, and I think it is really important around. This is about community, as Patrick said. It, it's not about individuals here. This is about working together. It's about thinking together. It's about talking together. And my doctoral research sort of concluded with this sort of notion of compassion focused education. And I just like to sort of give a, an insight into what that you know, look like from my, my perspective, really, but it's really thinking about how compassion might inform our pedagogy, you know, the way we design learning experiences, the way we interact with our children, young people, or, or for Patrick and I, adults, you know, in, a, in, a, in an educational context that can you know, increase anxiety, actually, you know, learning is often quite uncomfortable. And I think I think that's that is an important aspect of learning, but that we create a space where it's OK um, to experience that, that discomfort. I certainly did uh, over the last uh, well throughout my academic career, actually, I think actually, and I, you know, I think that's important. How compassionate might inform our practice, you know, again, the way we work with our, our students, the way we um, encourage them to engage authentically and to be able to talk about their lived experiences. I think that, you know, in safe educational uh, spaces and also to be able to, you know, talk about things that might be kind of controversial uh, with others. How we might, you know, think about our compassion might inform our curriculum. I mean, everything I talk about at Oxford Brookes University is about inclusion. It's about diversity. It's about equitable educational experiences about you know critiquing uh, educational experiences so I think you know that's really kind of important um, Laura mentioned there do we have behavior policies or do we have relational uh, you know policies around how we think about and how we respond to children's behavior do we see it as as confrontation or do we see it as actually a child experiencing potentially quite high levels of distress how might uh, compassion inform our kind of responses to um, children's behavior and I think that kind of leads into compassion focused I'd say school cultures but that's certainly we can create those cultures in our own in our own classrooms and that that I think leads to you know sort of you know teaching and learning pedagogy informed by uh, compassion so again a focus there on um, kind of compassion focused education I, and again I'd encourage you to think about how you might join this revolution. I think it's really kind of uh, important. I also think that this um, compassion focused education must be founded on certain principles that actually all our endeavors around education aim to facilitate the well-being of ourselves and others. I'm not sure that happens all the time, but I think we could be doing better at that actually. And that I think can be around empathetic connection with others. 
exhibiting care for others like Laura suggests little things just checking in checking in with our colleagues how are you doing today genuinely interested in, in you know being open and, and, and kind of present for others um, showing an awareness of difficulties in ourselves and others and talking about those is really important and that whole motivation aspect of compassion there is to prevent initially I think any sort of difficulties but if people are experiencing those how can we alleviate you know or support um, and how can we engage in activities that are actually you know healthy and, and, and helpful how can we interact more compassionately so that you know our colleagues and our children and young people or our students feel cared for um, actually a phrase from my doctoral research was about showing care and concern for others I thought that was a really nice um, phrase I thought you know really really important there are loads of initiatives happening across schools and universities that kind of support well-being authentically and you know I think it's really important that we continue to think about things in, in education that have the intention of promoting, encouraging and facilitating well-being in ourselves and others. I think that's really kind of important. And we amplify those, we do more of them actually. So we further enhance um, experiences that genuinely help and facilitate well-being. Sometimes I think we can act as filters, um, particularly for kind of senior leaders or we've got opportunities to think about, you know, anticipate that things might have a negative impact on others and really think about how we might reconsider those experiences adapt them to eliminate or reduce the impact and something I'm really you know keen to encourage is to resistance actually we've got to stop doing things that have a negative impact you know so we've got to prevent you know things that might experience difficulties or distress in others I think that's really um, important actually that we kind of I mean, I, I was thinking really carefully about this notion of encouraging compassion, but I think I want to incite compassion. That's how I feel about this. I think it's so important, actually, that we really do, you know, think about that together. And that, that for me, is what this kind of compassionate revolution is, is all about, actually. So um, there's my thoughts. Uh, I really like this image here, actually, that, you know, culture of school and classroom is the shadow of the teachers. I think that's really um, true. I, I, I'm embarrassed that I should, should be able to cite that image, but I've had it a long time. I don't know where I got it from. Um, and this is, a, I think, for me, a really kind of important uh, quotation. This is Professor Paul Gilbert and, and Choden. So I actually think we need more non-conformity in education. I think I'd encourage all teachers to be more non-conformist actually. We need to experience, uh, you know, this sort of compassionate non-conformity in education, uh, more resistance and so on. So um, just a little bit of self-promotion. Uh, if you're interested in sort of emotional development attachment, this is an excellent book, Cooper and Collie, uh, Collie and Cooper rather. Really practical advice there around supporting emotional development and attachment in the classroom. And I've got a chapter in this second book here around uh, mental health and wellbeing in school. That's a kind of critique really about how we respond to children with complex needs. I don't think compliance and control works very well. I think we should be more caring and compassionate. And there's a link to my doctoral research if you're interested. Um, where I've talked quite a lot about this sort of stuff. Uh, and then the last couple of pages there are, um, are references. They're often open access. So I hope you kind of um, hope, hope uh, you know, I hope uh, they're useful for you. So um, yeah, that, that's uh, essentially um, potentially a good place to uh, conclude our, our, our session uh, today. Again, I've kept an eye out for um, any kind of questions in 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 the um, in the chat or or the Q and A. So I think we've we've kind of managed to respond to those, and and we aim to finish between six and and quarter past. So I think I think we've 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 done that successfully. Um, so I'd just like to conclude by thanking our audience for attending uh, this afternoon. I know how busy uh, your professional lives are, so thank you very much for, for joining us this afternoon. I, I, I found this a really engaging um, opportunity to explore um, the importance of compassion in, in education, so I'd like to also thank our, our panel um, this afternoon. So thank you very much, Laura Dennis from uh, the Mulberry Bush organisation. Have a look at their website. Do get in contact with uh, Laura um, about any aspect of supporting children with more complex profiles. I know uh, you and the Mulberry Bush are very keen to offer support for, for local and now national and potentially international educational organisations. And yep. a very, you know, again, thank you, um, Professor Patrick Alexander, um, it's been really great to have you here this afternoon. And um, <clears throat> again, check out 
Patrick's work um, very much around young people's sort of future aspirations, really, isn't it? You know, thinking really, you know, carefully about, about their future and so on. And again, um, if Oxford Brookes University can help you with any kind of uh, research um, initiatives that you'd, you'd be keen for us to support with, do contact um, Professor Patrick Alexander, our Director of Research and Consultancy at um, Oxford Brookes University. I should also probably thank um, my colleague Will for organising uh, and Laura and Georgia for, um, you know, organising this event this afternoon. Um, very, very kind. And um, this session has been recorded and we will be able to um, share the recording with, with those of you that, that signed up and have been unable to make it um, for whatever reason. So thank you very much for attending uh, this afternoon's webinar and um, do keep an eye out for other kind of Think Human events that you might be interested in, in participating in. So um, now go and, go and spend a bit of time thinking about showing compassion to yourselves and uh, go and do something nice at the end of a busy day. I'm, I'm going to be taking a walk at some point this afternoon and uh, that's how I'm going to reflect and, and, and think about this afternoon's conversation. So I'll thank our audience again and I hope you found that interesting and engaging. I'll, I'll say goodbye for now.